Uh, today I'm going to have a quick talk with you guys. Uh, introduction to orchestration and M Collective. So the initial plan I had here was to just do the generic um, talk about M Collective thing. How does it work, etc. But I mean, you guys all know Ari, right? Ari's done that tons of times, and I'm not Ari. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. <clears throat> so just to go through this quickly, uh, my name is Peter, or Pete, or whatever you like. Um, I'm a developer at Puppet Labs here in London. And I've been working on M Collective for two years now. And before that, I was a developer for the original author of M Collective, R.I. Pinar. Um, I've, so I've been around since, uh, since before we got into the 1.2 stage. So I've seen it go from like just some guy's pipe dream to the software that we have today. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So like you can probably guess, I don't really do this very often. <laughs> um, I'm more about the shipping of the code than I'm about the speaking of the word. So at any point, if I just kind of freeze up and stare at the back, then I'm not having a stroke. You don't have to like <laughs> call the, the, the ambulance or anything. Um, that's just me getting the stage fright. So um, yeah, when I started working with Ari four years ago, <clears throat> um, I was basically fresh out of a very academic background, you could say. Um, I went to university in South Africa, I moved to England, and I worked at a university here as a lecturer. And um, so when I met him and I started working, um, I had no idea what was going on, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, my colleagues still mock me about my inability to computer. Like Luke said this morning, this is having a bit where you're standing behind the console and you're pulling the levers and you're pushing the buttons. If you put me behind that, I will pull all the levers, I will push all the buttons, and everything will catch fire. So. Um, when I started out and I saw M Collective the first time, I had no reference to compare this to. I didn't know what orchestration was. And all the words that you guys use, like deployment pipelines and cloud bursting and all these crazy, sexy things, meant absolutely nothing to me. Um, but I do have a love for theoretical computer science. So um, I hope you guys do too, because it's going to make up a large part of this talk. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, just on the, you know, the obvious scale, I don't think anyone will have any issues with it. So um, when I was looking at orchestration the first time, and I had to figure out, what is this? How does this work? I immediately related to something that I learned in my first year of computer science, which is finite state machines. So uh, hands up quickly, who of you guys are familiar with finite state machines? That's awesome. <laughs> that makes me really happy. Um, <laughs> It's going to make this a bit easier as well. Um, so a finite state machine has two elements that are important for us to discuss. Um, first of all, what is it? A finite state machine is an abstract machine that can only be in one of a finite number of states. Right? Come on. Yeah. And we can move from one state in this machine to another when an event or a condition is triggered. So just a quick example for the ones of you who aren't familiar with finite state machines. This would be an example of a turnstile, you know, at the, at the bus or whatever. Um, I'm going to be the guy at the bus. I show up, there's a turnstile. Crap, it's locked. I push it. I don't know if this laser's going to work. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, an event happens. We move forward in a transition. I push the turnstile. It stays locked. Crap, now what do I do? Huh, there's a coin slot. In goes the coin. Something happens. We move to a next state, the unlock state. All right, cool. Okay. I can put another coin, nothing's changed. Keep looping in the same state. Finally, when I push it, I go through, and we're locked again. All right, so this is stupid. Why, what does this have to do with anything? Um, <laughs> for me, orchestration and all orchestration can be simplified down to a finite state machine. If we're looking at something like a deployment pipeline, we start with our old application. Let's say we're deploying a web app, which I'll be doing in a bit. Um, we have our old application. It's over there. We need to get to this winning state at the end. There's a bunch of magic, but all that we're doing is we're transitioning from one state to another. Right? So if we're going to think of orchestration as a finite state machine, we have two jobs. First of all, we need to determine our states. If we're going to deploy a web app, let's say we have servers behind HA proxy or something, 
and we need to make this happen. We need to take them down, we need to do the update, we need to put them back. These are states that we're walking through. And we need to determine the transitions. How are we going to move from one state to another? All right? Is it going to be Puppet? Are you going to run some Puppet manifest to update your software? Are you going to write some m-collective actions? We'll get there. But these are the two big things that are important to remember. So uh, quick hands, and I'm, I promise I'll only do this once. I know you don't like audience participation. Um, who of you know what m-collective is? Awesome. And how many of you use mCollective today? And how many of you use mCollective? Um, how many of you use tools that you have created by using mCollective? That's a surprisingly awesome amount of number. Nice. So for the rest of you, mCollective is a framework for building orchestration tools and a parallel job execution system. So, like I said with the other talks um, that you'll see about M Collective all the time, people tend to focus on the job execution system. Right? I sit down, M Collective's on a bunch of machines, I type in some commands, things happen, boom. That's it. And the framework bit is always mentioned, but very rarely do you actually see people using the framework and sharing the idea. So a part of the talk that I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a uh, big air quotes, the simple deployment pipeline that I built with M Collective to show you how to use, utilize the framework bit of it. Okay. So just put that on hold for now. I do want to do a quick tour of the basic bits of M Collective. So for the people who aren't familiar with it, can just get a quick grasp of what it does. Um, <clears throat> very often I hear that people consider M Collective to be one of the more complex tools in the DevOps arsenal, but um, it really isn't. If you just break it down to the most simple points, it is actually very cool and very simple. So we have three parts to consider initially. Um, we need to move messages around. That is a core part of orchestration. Right? For that, in M Collective, we need message-oriented middleware. Now, this would be something like RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ. Um, if you're a Puppet Enterprise user, it's already there. It's already configured. And I don't want to go into that too, in too much detail because um, ActiveMQ especially is worthy of hours of angry on its own. So, so yeah, save the angry for another time. Um, then we have the mCollective server, uh, which I like to just refer to as mCollectiveD because the server context is sometimes a little bit weird. Why is your server called an agent sometimes? Why is the agent different to Puppet? So screw that. We're just going to call it mCollectiveD for now. Um, the mCollective server is basically a daemon that acts as a container for something that we call agents. Now, agents are, geez, what's the English word for this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's soortgelijke containers. There are similar uh, containers for uh, similar thinking. Sorry, this is my second language, <laughs> um, bits of code. So if we have a themed, there we go, similar themed pieces of code. So if we have an mCollective server, um, it'll have a bunch of agents on them. The agents are responsible for executing the code remotely. Okay? And then we have the mCollective client. The mCollective client's job is to send a message over the network so it can get out to the servers. The servers can call the agents. Stuff can happen. The message comes back. It get back, gets back to the client, and the client does a thing with it. Right? Cool. Um, clients are pluggable. All of this is pluggable, but we'll get to that in a bit. And collective dislike its plugins. So this is just a basic uh, sketch of the <clears throat> of the process that happens when we try and initialize uh, initiate a command with M collective. So we're sitting here at the client. We we have a, a situation where we would like to know the status of the puppet agent on our entire network, right? The message gets created, the RPC request gets created on the client. RPC in this context is the same as another one, remote procedure call. Um, people will cut me if they hear me say it, but M Collective actually works a lot like Corba. So, <laughs> yeah, if that helps you understand it. Um, the message gets created on the client. The client sends the message over to the middleware. The middleware then, as by magic, will distribute the messages to the servers. We don't care for now how that's happening. We just want to know that it does gets to the server, and on the server it looks something like this. Right. 
Our request will say that we need to determine the status of the puppet service. Inside the server, like I said, we have the agents. We have a list of agents there. We're going to hit up the service one. We want to call the action. Now, the action is the actual meat of the agents, right? Um, <clears throat> they are just little blocks of Ruby code that live in our agent DSL and that will execute when they get triggered. So in the case of the service one, we're actually going to use, well, a bit messed up, but we're going to be using the puppet RAL to determine the, the status of the puppet service itself, get the result, create a response, response leaves the server. And then it goes back. So we have the server here, stopped, stopped, a running one, goes back to the middleware, and the middleware fire these messages down to the client. Results are processed, and there you go. Um, is that legible at all? Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> so this is what it would look like. Um, call the mcollective command, and um, yeah, in case you're wondering, just a little anecdote, why did they call it MCO? That's the stupidest thing. Where does the O come from? Um, if you were around before 1.2, you will remember that we used to call things MC-ping and MC-inventory and that kind of thing, right? So when we, tr uh, yeah, next bit. But when we turned them into actual applications and we needed a, a executable, we remember that there's this thing called Midnight Commander. <laughs> uh, anyone used or still use or remember Midnight Commander? Yeah, it was pretty big in my transition from being you know, a little kid who played with Windows and DOS to like, wow, Linux. I, mean, I don't know any of these commands work, but ah, this thing's kind of like Norton Commander. I can go from there. Anyway, so run the M collective executable followed by something called the application. Now, application is another kind of client. Um, <clears throat> you'll, you'll often see that commands get called slightly different to this one, where instead of mcorpc service status followed by another thing, it would be mco service status puppet. So what that second parameter there is, is something that we call in, in this context an application. The application is a client that will call remote agents and then process results, give you pretty outputs, allow you to chain actions, things like that, okay? Uh, that's followed by the, <clears throat> the agent name, determine that we're gonna use the service agent, followed by the status action, followed by a single parameter. We need to know what service we're gonna be looking at. And then something at the end, which I will get into a bit more detail in a minute. And there's our results, right? Quite cool. It's unbelievable how dry your mouth gets when you're standing here and you're shaking. <laughs> okay, so back to my original point where I started this whole thing off on, on, on state machines, right? So, yes, I believe, and you don't have to agree with me because I'm sure a lot of people don't. This is just my, my little way of making sense of everything. That if orchestration can be seen as a state machine, how does M Collective actually work? Right, right to, work, to help us get toward this goal of, of creating a state machine. <clears throat> so I'm going to look at four sub, small little bits of M Collective to just try and, and try and get us there. Right. So we have states, we have transitions, but how does this work? Remember that initially I said that states change when things happen. Right. Um, I put a coin into the turnstile. I push on the thing like an idiot. I jump up and down, I scream. These things move me through states. The M Collective agents can be our facilitator for that. M Collective agents can change the state that the world is in. We can take a system where nothing's happening and we can kick Puppet. Right? We can start the service. We can install a package. You can do whatever you like. If you can codify it, you can do it with M Collective. Agents also determine the state the world is in. So if we're looking at it from the outside and you know, we're imagining a state machine, but you know, you, it's not a thing that you will see in code. This is how we can determine what state our world is in as well. So <clears throat> agents, how do they work? Pretty simple. Um, agents are made out of two parts. First of all, we have a DDL file, which is just, hey, that looks terrible. Can you see that as well? Or am I pushing my luck here? <laughs> well, Dan. <laughs> I'll use words and hand waving to describe it and 
Let's, let's hope that works, right? So the, the point of the DDL is sort of like something like a JSON schema, if you're familiar with that. Um, it defines what the agent looks like, and it defines what the agent can do. So at the top here, in that red mess, <laughs> you'll see that we have the metadata. Now, the metadata is normally something used by us, not so much by you. We'll use it for packaging and, and stuff like that. But the important bit here is the action. So what you're looking at here is a snippet from an agent that I wrote for the demo that I'll be doing in a bit um, that is going to determine the status of servers on an HA proxy backend. Right? Um, we take a single input. It's called the, back, it's the backend's name. We give you type validation because it is a framework, right? It, it needs to do more than just let you run commands. <clears throat> and we're going to get two outputs back. The state, uh, a list of all the disabled servers and a list of all the enabled servers. Cool. All your agents need to have one of these. Um, if you remember, again, from the 1.2-ish days, we changed this in 2.0, that you used to be able to define the metadata inside the <coughs> agent itself for like, the old users here, like Tom over there. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, now all your agents need to have one of these. And secondly, an implementation file. And then I hope this one actually shows. OK, that, that should be better, less red. Nice. Um, so the implementation of the actions are very simple. They're just bits of Ruby code. They don't have to be bits of Ruby code. Right? Um, looking at this from top to bottom, we have a run method over there, right? which what it basically does is it does the fork and exec for you. Right? It shells out. So to determine the state, status <coughs> of the service on the HA proxy backend, I installed a gem called HA proxy CTL. I'm just doing the show health command with back in the server name. And that's going to give me, um, give me standard in back, and I'm just going to parse it. Right? Check what's in maintenance, check what's not checked. Assume the one is enabled, the other one is not. All right. <coughs> Jeez. So dry. All right. Um, next up, next thing I want to discuss. When we're looking at a finite state machine, we're looking at a snapshot of the entire world in the context of that finite state machine. Right? When, we, when we go back to the turnstile one, example I had in the beginning, when we look at that turnstile, everything in there is relevant. All the actors. I am the actor, pulling the thing, putting in the coin. The turnstile is a thing, and all these things are relevant. But in the real world, when we're doing things like building deployment pipelines or other magical things that you guys do, um, that's not always relevant. Because we have web servers. We have load balancers. We have other things. I don't want to tell my web server to restart when I'm trying to restart my load balancer. Right? So by default, um, M Collective source of truth of the network is, some, is done by something called discovery plugins. Now, um, in the default discovery case, which is the only one I'm going to cover because the rest you can look at yourself, they're boring, um, the client will send a message, say, hey, everyone, uh, please respond. I need to send you a real message. Gives them a timeout. Two seconds. You have two seconds to get back to me. The service will sit there and go, yep, I'm here. I have M collective agent. You can tell me what to do. Message comes back, and then the message gets broadcast to everything, right? But that's bad. Because we don't always want to be touching all the, all the things all the time. Right? Like I mentioned, don't want to restart your web server when you don't intend to. You don't want to install a package on this box if it needs to be on the other box. So we have a desire for finer grained filtering. Right? And M Collective, who knew, gives you the option to filter your request to agents. And there are four methods that we're going to look at. The first one is filtering on facts. So, <clears throat> In this example, I'm using something called the YAML fact source, which is just basically a YAML file built up by going factor minus Y, pipe it into something that is your facts, and then use Puppet to update it occasionally as things change. Um, we also have a plugin that lets you get the values directly from factor. And basically anything that you can think of that generates facts. If there's a fact, we can parse it. Right? So in this example, we're just doing a ping, and we're limiting that to all the machines, all my Red App machines. So there you see the result. We've got five web server-esque looking things and something that could be a load balancer. Right. Secondly, we can filter on public classes, okay, which is incredibly cool. So 
for the context of this, uh, for the context of the demo that I'll be doing in a bit, um, as you can see, as these nodes come up, these are the ones I'm going to be using. Um, I broke them up and, uh, by using classes. I made three groups of them. So here I'm hitting up group two, which is hopefully going to be the one to fail soon. And it's just going to return the single node. Right. Thirdly, we can filter on identity. Tell the machine directly, you, node seven, or you, whatever your name is, I'm going to send you a thing, and no one else is going to listen. We can use that, do that by using the identity filter. So what you can see there is um, that looks slightly more complex than the other examples I had, where we just have a string. Here we have a regular expression. We're going to be hitting everything that starts with web one, web two, and web five. Right? So filtering can be quite powerful and complex. And as you can see in the results, we have one, two, and five. Right. And finally, um, I, I know I said I was going to ask for audience participation again, but just bear with me for a second. Um, do any of you use the compound filtering language in M Collective? <laughs> Cool, and uh, do any of you know about it? Any of the rest of you know about it? Hands if you've seen it before, or if it's just magic words. Yeah, okay, magic words, cool. Yeah, I get to teach you about a thing, that's great. <laughs> um, so, relatively recently, we added a, um, a logical language to filter on. Now, you can see it gives you access to all the logical operators and ors and nots. And then you can filter on a combination of classes and a combination of facts, giving you very finely grained control of what you hit. All right. Um, all right. I might have to speed this up because I'm kind of running out of time. Yeah. OK. Um, all right. So the last thing before we get to the demo uh, is a little thing called data plugins. Now, data plugins are very similar to agents. They are also code that gets executed remotely. <coughs> Uh, yeah, and they enable you to determine state by executing code. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so um, it consists of the same two parts as agents, a DDL and an implementation, but they have one difference, right? There is an implicit contract when you write a data plugin that um, it will not change the state of the world. A data plugin can go and determine state, but it can never change it. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly look at this because. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to see this. Uh, same thing, metadata. And instead of implementing actions or defining actions, we define a data query. Implementation. Um, if you ever happen to look at the implementation for the, the service agent, the um, data plugin is actually using the same do service action method that we use in the other one, in the agent. So they're very tightly coupled and they're very similar. And then the question comes up, why do these things exist? Right? To, if you can already do that with Asia. And that's because of the implicit contract, which allows us to do this. By putting, <clears throat> uh, by having that contract, we can call data plugins inside the context of discovery, which gives you context sensitive discovery, which I think is amazing. Right? It, it, yeah, it makes me really excited in ways that I shouldn't discuss in front of 300 odd people. But <laughs> yeah. Um, so what we do in there is I am checking. OK, machines, if you're in group three, if Puppet is alive on you, come back to me. If not, bail. Right? And that's great. And this has changed. You can do things like respond to me if this package is installed. And if the package isn't installed, go. Uh, install a package, or trigger a Puppet run, or do something awesome. OK. So the, the little demo I want to show off, and I know this is a bad idea because demos always explode. So. If you see me in the bar later crying, it's OK. You don't have to console me. It's my own fault. Uh, we're going to have five web servers that are going to be sitting behind a load balancer. We're going to mark a web server as down. We're going to update the application. We're going to put it back up again. And then we're going to get money. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the web servers got grouped by puppet classes. And this is the finite state machine that we're going to end up building. Oh, it's amazing. So we have five states, many transitions. We're going to start in our pre-deployment phase. We have nothing. We have a very sad horse. And we're going to try to get that to a very shiny horse. And you'll see what I mean by the horse in a second. Um, events. We remove it from the load balancer. Or we fail to remove it from the load balancer. 
This leaves us an end state, a failed end state that we can't move from. Successfully remove. We're ready for upgrade. All right, now what can we do? We, success we upgrade. Is it successful? Move into the ready for load balancer state. Otherwise, we fail. All right, put it back. Fail to return, back in the failed state. Return it, we have a successful deploy. See, it's awesome. Finite state machines. <laughs> Everything is a finite state machine. Uh, the code for the demo is on GitHub over there. And here goes everything. Whoa. That's not where I expected you to be. OK, so can you see that? That's going to be a bit small. How's that? Oh, I'll give it. Yee. Cool. OK, I don't need that thing anymore. Right, so this is our start state. We're pre-deploy, and we have our five web servers. That's a result from the HA proxy agent when I showed you earlier. <coughs> and I'm limit limiting the query to the load balancer machine, as I said, because filtering is awesome. OK, so here we go. And this will be the wrong one, because testing. How does that work? Right. Um, I'll show you the code in a second. I hope we have time for that. Um, we're going to upgrade these three groups, one group at a time. We're going to walk through all the states in the finite state machine, and one of them is going to fail. So something I didn't mention earlier, which is I should have. I apologize. Um, to make this crash spectacularly cool, I added another state check to the finite state machine, which is, is Puppet enabled on the machine? If it is, abort, because it's easy to just fiddle. All right. And there we go. That's our web app that we're upgrading in the background. Sad horse. OK, so this is the first cluster complete. We can see uh, we've disabled the group. We've done our upgrade. Puppet was disabled, like the check that I had in earlier. Successfully upgraded. Put it behind the load balancer. <laughs> Boom. It's great. Stops us. All right. Staggered deploys, right? You don't want to do this all at the same time. You don't want the whole, the whole thing to blow up. Or you might, but then you're me. Uh, yeah, there we go. All right. Going back to our finite state machine. And that's a horse. We've gone through the process of being in our start state, event happening, the event failing, dropping us in our failed deploy. But anyway, we've got to continue, because that's just what we do. All right. And here we can see it running to completion. Out of our five web servers, four of them are behind the load balancer. Fifth one is disabled. Couldn't do the upgrade. It's fine. We don't worry about it. We can go and fix it by hand. Oh, that's not water. And we can see that the horse is now slightly less sad. Because <laughs> Pegasi are awesome. I don't have time. Don't? OK, cool. All right. So just how would we deal with the broken one? It's quite simple. That's pretty small, too. We're just going to stop up it on it. And the poor little vagrant VMs are trying their damnedest. There we go. Why don't we give group two another shot? Right, Puppet is disabled. We can move to our next state. Epic success. <laughs> right. So yeah, um, the point of all this hand waving and, and me going on is that 
M Collective might seem complex the first time you take a look at it, because you know middleware is hateful. Terminology is sometimes not as good as it could be, but we're working on that. And yeah, but if you just take this, the basic parts, you can do awesome stuff with it. Um, I'm not going to have time to do both questions and the code. So uh, yeah, GitHub, if you want to check it out, it's really simple. Um, and yeah, any questions? Yes, uh, we do support RabbitMQ. Do you mean an enterprise or no, just in general? Uh, right. We do support RabbitMQ right now. We do have a connector for it. Um, and we've done a lot of work on it in the last development release to make it a bit more scalable. So yeah, it's there. And I hope, hopefully, it's just going to get better over time. Anyone else? Yes. Um, we have had an experiment with, uh, with Redis. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, yeah, Ari's, Ari's done one with that. Um, like I said, all, the, all these connectors are pluggable. So uh, yeah, if you write it, <laughs> we, will, <laughs> we will use it. <laughs> and um, if you need help writing it, you can ask myself or my colleague, Richard Clamp. Uh, he's actually the brains of the operation. You can see I'm just good with the hand waving. And um, yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, man. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear. Okay. So the benefit you get from using data plugins is that data plugins can be used in discovery. And if you've looked at our um, at our action policy, where you define your RBAC roles. Uh, you can also use the data plugins in there. So the reason that we don't use agent, um, agents is because of that implicit contract that I mentioned earlier. If you're going to run an agent that could change the state of your machine, you don't want to be changing state while you're deciding what you're going to be running things on. Yes, you can pass it into the compound filters. OK, and I think my time is up. Any last questions? That is a great question. <laughs> um, I, w I would like that to happen. Um, and I'm sure that is something that we'll be working on in the very near future. Because it is stupid to have multiple query languages. I agree with you. Um, right? Bar o'clock? Excellent. <laughs>